fountain of blood that was shed for us. Christ took it all for on him that we might be called righteous, holy, spotless. Because of his blood, we can come boldly into the throne room of grace. The way it is torn. And the Lord is on our side. He is with us. He will never, never leave us now for sickness. Hallelujah, this morning, Lord, we come to the table with grateful hearts, with thankful hearts for what you have done for us, Jesus. You, you gave us hope to live, to sing out and shout out for joy. One day in eternity, we will shout for joy. The King of kings and Lord of lords, he's coming, he's getting closer than ever before. And we praise you, God, that we are on your side. If God be for us, who can be against us? This morning as a church, we confess your word in our life, Father God. We are words of eternal life unto the throne room of grace, the joy and kindness called sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, morning, even as we hear from your word, open our spiritual eyes that we can, Lord, see the risen Savior. The risen Savior, the risen Lord. Scripture puts everything in perspective. 
When we look, when we look at the recorded words of the church elders, Hallelujah. after Paul and Peter and all these people died, the church elders were writing letters to each other because that's what that's how you communicated in those days, right? Maybe not until 20 years ago, that's how you did it. Uh, and they communicated to each other by writing the words of Paul, writing the words of Peter, quoting it. You know, quoting parts of it, just like we're doing. Even though, you know, scripture was scarce in those days. Not everybody had Paul's letter. Not everybody had Peter's letter. That was all put together about 300 years afterwards. But yes, the letters were there, they were being faithfully copied. And so on. So, it's very important to value the scripture that God has given us. It's in one place, you know, three, uh, some 386 AD, it was put together. And of course, in, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, verse 1, verse 2, chapter 1, chapter 2. That all, that all happened in the 11th century. Faithful scribes, they said, okay, it's, it's going to be hard, so let's just break it down into scripture verses. So that's how we have it. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Do we have it? Okay. So, I will start here, but I don't know where God is going to take me. Okay. Uh, For the grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, righteously and godly in the present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, the word sin, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. There's a lot contained in there, and it will take a very long time, a length of time, to actually go through every single one of them. But one of the things that uh, we've got to value when we come before the Lord, every time we come before the Lord is, his great goodness and His love for us. It should automatically, spontaneously come out, bubble out of our hearts in the form of worship. See, uh, the Lord loves His children to be thankful, to have a gratitude for Him and for His, uh, you know, presence in our lives. Because the Lord has already done every miracle you know, it, it has been written in a book, and we claim that miracle by faith. And we walk a walk of faith. Sometimes God takes us through the valleys before we bring to the we come to the top. And when we're in the valleys, the perspective of life changes because we don't see everything that people are the top see. However, that's where the praise starts. The rivers of praise start in the valleys. And as we start in the valleys, then God is able to do the amazing thing that when we worship and deliver us that miracle. So number one is we have to honor and organize our lives around worship, around worshiping God. And worshiping God is not just 15 minutes on a Sunday service. Worship is everything we do. Worship is spending quiet time with God. And worship is you know, expressing the love and the gratitude to God. I know that I'm preaching to everybody that knows this, but are we all practicing uh, this on a moment-by-moment basis, on a daily basis? You know, sometimes, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a friend of mine that I uh, used to associate with quite a bit. He came from a life of drug addiction and all kinds of sin. And he got set free, wonderfully set free, and filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, because of the drugs affecting him over many years, he couldn't speak very clearly. He had to, you know, he would start to understand because that's what the drugs did to him. Anyway, he came to glorious salvation, and uh, God touched him in such a powerful way, with such a fire and an anointed influence upon every everyone around him church group leader and all of that. This, I learned a lot from him. One of the things I learned from him was when he gets into the car, he's off speaking. 
praises to God. Sometimes the praise of other tongues, sometimes just praising God. Loudly. Sometimes the tram people, you know, the trams look down and have a look at what's going on here. Praise is going on. Worship is going on. Worship is going on. And, you know, if you, if you read the table of um, the altar of incense that is before the mercy seat of God is the table of praise, worship, and intercession. Praise, worship, and intercession. The Lord allows His people to praise Him and to, and to be connected to Him because worship is the way we connect to God. And there are things that the Holy Spirit does in our life and shares secrets and shares ideas and shares the keys to solving problems when we are in close adoration and worship. And so that's one of the things that we ought to be doing. So in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. So, on the one hand, put away worldly lusts and ungodliness. So, the two things that hinder us all the time is to love the world and denying God or denying the work of God. God speaks to us sometimes very clearly. Hallelujah. But ungodliness is not just living in the world. Ungodliness is not being God focused, not being obedient, not being, you know, there are things that a parent doesn't need to tell the child to do all the time if the child is old. You know, or even an adult, the employee doesn't need to be told all the time exactly what the boss wants, the man who wants. Um, now we're in a father-son-daughter relationship, father and children relationship with God. We ought to understand the heart of the father. Sometimes we don't need to be told, this is what you need to do. But we need to understand the heart of God. How do we understand the heart of God? Through godliness. Godliness is focused on God. So in other words, our passage here on looking at this table that is the finished work of the cross, God says, this is the, the down payment for your miracle. The down payment for your miracle has already happened. We are remembering this. In uh, Luke 22, uh, when the Lord Jesus is, you know, is describing to his disciples, what is he doing? Giving the significance. You want to turn over there, show up please, to Luke 22.
This is my body, which is given for you. That body that the Lord Jesus gave on the cross on that day in Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem, almost 2,000 years ago, is the down payment for a miracle, for a provision, for a peace, for a healing. And so, that's why the Lord says, do this in remembrance of me. Amen? Likewise, also, the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament of my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayed me is with me on the table. Talking about Jews. So I don't want to go into that part. But verse 20 again. This is the New Testament in my blood. So he starts a New Testament. New Testament means a new covenant, new agreement. You know, signed with blood. New agreement, signed with blood. We remember from the Old Testament, Abraham was asked to sign with blood. Can you remember? With his own blood. Anybody? That was the circumcision. That was the covenant of circumcision. So the Lord, the Lord Jesus here says, okay, I'm going to give you a new and a better covenant. A new better covenant with my own blood. Righteous blood. Sinless blood. So that, so that we can actually do what God wants us to do in Titus chapter 2 verse 11. We can skip back there, sure. So Titus 2, chapter 11 is, you know, think about it. Paul has a very small amount of time to convey to his protege, Titus. Titus is one of two. Timothy and Titus. These are young converts from the Greek tradition. They converted. Titus' mom was a Jew. Oh, uh, sorry, Timothy's. Titus was a Greek. So they go on travel tours to all the 18, 19 places that are mentioned in Acts. And finally he says, okay Titus, now you have come to maturity, I want you to go to Dalmatia and go and pastor this church or look after the flock. And he leaves them there and then he is near the end of his life. He has to write some, some encouragement, some warning, some advice to Titus. He crunches it all down to three chapters. Three sections, if you like. And he writes this letter, and one of the things he says is the one we're reading. So this great apostle served God for 35 years, writing to his protege in Dalmatia, who's like, you know, I have to be the next generation of leadership after Paul goes. He is the distilled version to Paul, from Paul to Titus. And we're reading this. Verse 13, sorry, verse 12. Teaching us that denying our godliness and worldliness, we should live soberly. Soberly means clear minded. Always being clear minded. Always one of the attacks of the enemy, which the blood will appear if we're covered in the blood. One of the attacks of the enemy is on the mind. Very strongly, we have to guard our mind. The Word of God says very clearly, you know, as your eye wanders, your mind wanders. So that's start. That's the same. Uh, in scripture it says, you know, um, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, your thinking has to be purified for God. You have to filter out the things that hit your mind. You have to apply. And the blood of the Lord Jesus will help us apply because it keeps us sober, sober minded. Amen? Every time we come to church, we have a great opportunity here to have communion every Sunday to remember God's precious sacrifice. And to look at scriptures, because scriptures are the ones that build our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And the washing of the word, the regeneration which Paul talks to Titus as well. So, denying our God in this to bring the things that are in our mind, by filtering the head, you know. So saying no to things that hit our mind often and as early as possible. As early as possible and as often as possible. Keep on saying. You know, something that's in the land of the word of God, you have to take your place in the kingdom and say that. And say, no, that's not what God, God wants me to do. Amen. So we all go through conflicting decisions in life. So mindedness is the ability that God gives through His purchase 
to have a clear thinking mind and to have a stable mind. Amen? Number two, righteousness. Righteousness is the ability to do right. So we may all know what the right thing to do is, but to actually do it, the last mile, is so hard. So hard. Somebody at work is going through a problem. Someone in the family is going through some difficulty, financial, health, whatever. That last mile between, yeah, I think I need to do it. How many of you have said, I think I need to do this, but have really struggled with actually doing it? The blood of the Lord Jesus is the one that helps us, the enables us, the, the Holy Spirit that we have been given. Again, we're going, to, we're going to see that in verse 13. So, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. So, again, this is Tyndall's 13th century English. So, if we were to write peculiar in the common language, we would say special, <coughs> special people. Special people, so blessed people, um, a separated people, someone that is unique, zealous of good works. Now, this is the second thing that the Lord Jesus wants us to meditate upon today. And that is doing good works. Doing good works, a lot of people say, okay, I'll leave the job, I resign everything, and I go as a missionary overseas, or I give away all my wealth to the poor, and all of that. I mean, those are all, it's, it's actually, uh, it's a continuum of which there are many things you could line up against that continuum. You could start with just praying for others. You could start with just interceding in a quiet place or somebody going through a difficulty. It could be that we go and see somebody and pray for them. It could be that we tell them some encouraging word of the Lord Jesus or give them a book, a CD, a tract. Or somebody might be in financial strife, helping them out, or in fact, helping move houses, you know, looking after elderly relatives, parents, grandparents, etc. So, good works is a continuum, but ultimately, the good work that God wants us to do is the one that God puts us in our heart. He doesn't want you to go hunting for good works out there when there's enough and more in our heart. But this is enough in our heart. To go, okay, I should do that. I should do that. If it, if it hits our radar, then it's on our radar. It's for us to do something. So good works is more well defined, I guess, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's talking about money here, but the context is money. But the principle is universal, standard. So why it is important is also explained here. It's not just to get, you know, a pat on the back from the Lord Jesus. Not only that, it's because we have now been, we are now the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus on earth. The Lord Jesus has gone to heaven. The Holy Spirit is here. And so, because we are blood bought, you know, and, our, and the Lord Jesus' body has cleansed us, this is what we do. We have become the hands and feet of God to, to help out. So, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And there's a few verses I want to read. So, let's go from... Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen? So, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, let us there be content. In other words, this is the attitude we come into. It's not just for Timothy today. It's the attitude of contentment is what keeps our peace. And when we are peaceful, then God can add the blessing and God. When we say, 
that is okay, you know, I can go without for a little bit, but let me have somebody. Then God cannot hold himself back from blessing you, apparently. But we don't do it just to manipulate his heart. We don't manipulate the heart of God with that. But we are just being Hallelujah. God's children as we should be. Amen. So, verse 9. But they that be rich fall into a temptation and a snare. I was a trap. Remember, there's a temptation is the pathway to the trap. Temptation is the door that leads to the trap of the enemy. And so, when Paul says to Timothy, he means in his day and time, the temptation was to walk away from God. That was just the easiest thing because they were killing everybody. They were saying, I believe in the Lord Jesus' resurrection. I know him, or I know somebody that knows him, and he rose from the dead. Okay, put your head here, chop. Okay, okay. The point is, it was a life threatening situation. The temptation was to walk away. But the temptation also. If you notice in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, Alexander the Coppersmith. Brilliant example. Coppersmith, who made images to their false idols, converts, and then says, No, I want to go back to it because I, I, I used to get all my money there. That was my living. And then not only did he go back, he ended up putting Paul in a lot of difficulty. You read that in the Second Timothy. Beware of Alexander the Coppersmith, he says. For he did me much harm. So he's one of those examples in verse 9. Rich fall into a temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. I know that people misuse, misquote scripture. And you see misquoted scripture everywhere today. It's saturated. That's why worship and reading the Bible gets you with, with, with God. It tells you the right thing. It tells you right from wrong. Amen. So the Lord Jesus wants us to focus on doing good works. Why? Because verse 18, verse 17 and 18. And I think, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Even in Paul's day, riches were uncertain. It is so. But in the living God, who, give us, who gives us richly all things to enjoy, they, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, communicate and share in, in this third century. So, willing to share, ready to distribute. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. Time to come is the new kingdom. The new kingdom, when it comes, the only thing that is of value is the things that we've done here on earth for others and for the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, against time that they may lay hold on eternal life. So, all of these things are things that flow out <coughs> of coming into communion with God. Communion through the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus. It has to produce something out of it. And that producing is going to benefit not only others, but also our own spirit. We built up, built up. When we then go out of the valley, when we come out of the valley in the modern God, you get a new perspective, new views, new things. And you're out of the, the hard places that you couldn't produce. Then you will realize the value of actually the path that the Lord has put us on. Amen? So here at Communion, let's again, once again, I want us to go one more time just over this. So the down payment for a miracle is here. Table of provision, table of pity, table of peace. And all of the things that we're seeking in God today, right now, promises to be fulfilled. All of these things are right here. So as we commune with God, as we take communion, as we remember the body that was sacrificed for us, the blood that was shed for us, speaks of better things than they were still. I don't know if you realize, but the blood is spoken of as a separate separate entity. In maybe we can look at that briefly. So Hebrews chapter twelve. 
this is really amazing for me. And uh, I think it would be useful for us to look at verse 22. Hebrews 12, verse 22. And you have come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, speaking of the heavenly Jerusalem, right? So even though we're here physically on earth, when we worship God, we're transported, we're in the heavenly Jerusalem. That is the beauty of worship. Before your, your worship is organized, organize your worship. Amen? So, 22. Unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. That's the first thing. To the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. So this is, these are the martyrs. The church of the firstborn is the martyrs that have been killed for the faith in God. It includes Old Testament saints, I have to say. You read Hebrews chapter 11, one chapter before that. Tells us. Next. Uh, which are all written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all. So now it talks about Father God, number three. Okay? The angels, martyrs, Father God, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, that is, New Testament saints, that are gone on to the, uh, you know, that are on earth and in heaven, and to Jesus, number five. Right? Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, mediator, mediator. Okay? In the context of two parties that are opposing each other, Hallelujah. being mediated by somebody, the Lord Jesus. And finally, and to the blood of the sprinkling, that's speaking better things than they will, distinctly called out. Amen? So, That's, that's why it is so precious. Every week we get this opportunity to do it. A lot of churches don't do communion every week. Amen? But here, as we come to the communion, let's finally look at Mark chapter 15. I think it will be very important to look at it. Because it would speak the things that we've got to do. So the Lord says, I don't know to who it is, but somebody, things are not as they look to the outer appearance about a certain situation or a decision you might make. Something is in front of you that looks correct, looks perfect, but things are not as they appear. And so something to consider and ask God about it. And if you're considering a decision or a change or a move or some, you know, something, even a relationship, things are not as they appear. So it's something to take to God and ask God what it is. And, and, and the Lord is also saying to organize yourself, to organize us into order, arrange, prepare, Get organized. Get organized. In other words, if some things in your life are not organized yet to serve God or to be dedicated to God, the three things we do, right? To be dedicated to God, to worship God, and to do good works. In other words, to serve God. Dedicate and um, worship God and serve God. So, Mark chapter 15. Um, we don't have a lot of time to go through all of this in detail. However, you should probably take it home and read it. John chapter 15. What did the Lord Jesus go through? He went through temptation to... He, the strongest temptation that he had was he could... At, 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 at a twinkling of an eye, he would call 12 legions of angels and say... Smash this place clean, thank you. Right? And nobody will be allowed to tell the story, right? He could have done that. Probably not. Hallelujah. Okay. 
But the point I'm making is very simple. The Lord Jesus could have changed any of the circumstances that he was forced to live. He just didn't. Pilate, this is the thing. Pilate asked him again, verse 4, Answer thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. So they were just vehemently accusing him. This wasn't a tender chat. This was a night of turmoil in his life. Started it, you know, after sundown. We all know that. Because they came with they came with the weapons, but also the lamps, right? To the garden of Gethsemane. It was dark. So right from there the thing started, the, the turmoil. And they take him to Pilate and accuse him. This man did this, this man did this, and he said this, and he did that, and he's plotting an insurrection. And the and Pilate says, Do you say nothing? <coughs> Let's ask yourself, or each one of us the question. Have people challenged us, abused us, rebuked us, accused us, you know? wrongfully and having been tempted to respond in time. Yeah, I did this, but you did this too. But what about you? What about this? What about that? No, no, I didn't do it this way. I, you know, defending yourself or accusing others. But you know what? The Lord Jesus didn't do anything. The Lord Jesus went to the cross as a lamb to the Jews. That is what he has purchased for us. In other words, the defense, our defense, has been purchased by the silent one who went to the cross silently, took all the accusations, and then nailed them to the cross. And then each one of us has accusations against us, maybe in the spiritual realm, we don't know. There are things that the enemy of God is saying to the Heavenly Father right now about me, about you, about each one of us. Oh, he didn't do this, and he should have done this, and he should, you know, she should have done this. But the Lord Jesus was silent on the earth, took it all on the cross. Amen? I, I get very, very emotional here. Because he didn't say a thing. He didn't say a thing. Amen? And secondly, if we look at... What evil has he done? They cried all the more exceedingly, crucify him, crucify him, verse 14. So, even the Pilate, the Gentile judge, the Gentile prelate at that time, even the Gentile prelate could say, he hasn't done anything wrong. Let's say you go to the court, you know, somebody takes you to the court, and the judge says, he hasn't done anything wrong. She hasn't done anything wrong. No, no, but crucify Crucify They don't let you go. I'm so thankful that the, that the Lord has uh, blessed Australia with Christian Prime Minister today. Let's all thank God for that. Amen? Hallelujah. So, here we have a good Christian Prime Minister, and the first thing the media does is try and travel with the questions, obviously, to get what side of the agenda he's on, what is his agenda, what is his thing. But they don't go to him, they go to his pastor. And they go to his pastor and ask him very tricky questions. Maybe he should have said, go away, don't see me again. But he engaged with them. And there's a lot of fodder in the marketplace right now where people are commenting and saying, oh, the right wingers have taken over and look what he's got behind him. It's a hill song style takeover of Australia. Hallelujah. But the point I'm making is the accusations never stop, even after the judge said, Pilate said, no, he has done anything wrong. Never stop. My point is, that didn't stop for the Lord Jesus, so that it will stop for us. So our accusers will stop because the Lord Jesus is already paid on the cross. We have the right to go to the Heavenly Father right now and say, these accusations have to stop, Lord. We have grounds to claim that because Hallelujah. the Lord Jesus was the one that took that accusation on our cross. So, that's another example of what we see in the crucifixion narrative. And then, of course, you know, save thyself and come down from the cross. Remember that? Another temptation. Save yourself. 
the Lord is interpreting the physician said you know, they will say, you know, on the first day of his ministry, he said, this is what he's going to say. Hallelujah. And then at the end of his ministry, they say, save yourself. If you're the son of God, save yourself. He who will save others will save himself. And mocking me, obviously, you know. Can you hear sometimes the enemy mocking? Can you hear? I hear. I hear. You know, a lot of people may not really fully grasp this, but I do because I've been handled, I guess, in development that way by demons. They've tried to do things. I have seen an angel, I have seen the Lord Jesus on the cross, I have, you know, in a dream or in a vision. I know what I'm talking about when I say that I hear voices sometimes mocking in my ear. I'm kneeling down to pray and I hear mocking voices. I'm going, this is happening, ladies and gentlemen, whether you believe it or not, whether or not, you know. These mockings have been dealt with on the cross. That is what this signifies for us. Amen? So it is very powerful. If and when we do come across false accusations or misjudgment or mockings, he is why, he is why we have the right to go to Father God and say, Father, this is not right. The Lord Jesus, our Lord, has already taken over the cross. This should stop right now. Amen? So it's not only a type of healing, of peace, of fruition, of prosperity, and of redemption. It is also all of these other things. There's so many things we can meditate upon, but we're out of time. So can I just ask two brothers to come share the communion with you? And let's all stand up as we do.
a few breaks and sisters. And give them all a great applause for all the worship team and the members for being here. God bless you all. I know why it's this is fun. And I uh, hope all of you are in a great week. And many of us were quite sick last week. But praise God, the God is uh, very powerful. He's healing us, every one of us. Today, ladies and brothers and sisters, good morning to all of you. And uh, any uh, prayer request, please let us know. We'll pray for you. And any newcomers today this morning, brother, uh, may I ask you to stand if you can. Uh, and very relieved. Will you live by close by here? I did it. Uh, please, please. What's your name, brother? Oh, uh, please, please. Take it. And also, good to see you. Good morning. 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 And also, and, uh, many of you this morning, the first of this morning, brothers and sisters, I've got very limited time and uh, before Hawking comes and shares the word of God, if anything that you would like to share, please let us know very quickly. And especially if it's taking place today, and please let us know. Um, this? Um, my child. Is it? Tomorrow is my child. Network. Network, sure, we pray for you, please. And uh, anything else you want to share? Uh, Sister Sylvia's birthday. Wow, praise God. Sister, we will be praying for you as well. Uh, we've been uh, praying for you family brother, almost every day. And uh, God may surely deliver to uh, do a great job in your life. And it is, uh, it is uh, nothing else except in your life. But, uh, but uh, vision has got an appointed time. In the, in the time of the living God, everything God will make everything so beautiful in your life as well. I believe this morning in your life. Dear brothers and sisters, anything that you want us to share? What is this? Oh, Krishna Bhante, Brother Sandy, and uh, we'll be getting here as well. Thank you. And uh, if you all can stand, and uh, uh, if you don't mind, please stand. We'll pray quickly and pass the mic to Hawthorne, and the offering will be collected as well. If you can uh, hold the offering in your hands, we'll pray quickly. Dear brothers and sisters, this is a time for uh, giving thanks to God and also doing the great and mighty things the Lord. And also, I believe uh, you can uh, please close your eyes, the brothers and sisters, wherever you are. I'm going to pray for you this morning. The supernatural healing of God may come upon your life this morning. I pray this morning, everyone's heart's desire, petitions in your, uh, unto God, God may fulfill them this morning. I pray this morning, those that are suffering with financial difficulties, those that are waking up on God for a breakthrough in their life. Dear brothers and sisters, I pray for you today. Supernaturally, so God will restore to you everything that the enemy has stolen from your life. Supernaturally, so God will bless you mightily, powerfully. If you are waiting for something in your life, supernaturally, so for a mountain to be moved off from your life, dear brothers and sisters, please uphold your request in the presence of God today. God will move powerfully in your life. Impossible thing, God will make them possible today. Impossible thing, God will make them possible through the precious bread of the living God. And also I pray this morning, every demonic operation that people are encountering in their life, I declare today, every plan of the enemy be shattered through the precious bread of the living God. For those that are waiting for a breakthrough, for those that are waiting for a job, for a job, for, a, for those that are waiting for financial breakthrough, for those that are waiting for children in their life, Surely I declare in the house of God, dear brothers and sisters, I declare in the house of God, those that come to the house of God, they will not go out with empty-handedness. God will restore, God will restore everything that enemy has stolen from your life. I pray this morning that you will surely go out with the joy, with the strength of God in the land of the living, that those that come to God, they will not be, they will not be put to shame, says the word of God. Dear brothers and sisters, this morning, I pray when the door, when the poor and needy receive water and their son and their tongues faded, uh, they faded from thirst, I know Lord will hear them. I know God of Israel will not forsake them, says the word of God. When the poor and needy seek the water and there is none, there is no water is found and their tongue fails, faded from thirst, I know Lord will hear them. The God of Israel will not forsake them. Father, we come in this day, Lord. Before how we come to my shadow of God to the Father. I pray this morning, Jesus, that 
because the God who speaks is the Make the Lord in heavenly places. Our God is the God who communicates with the Lord for each and every one of us in a very intimate way. How is God be able to know that he is the like the bright sunshine? Like it unfolds, as it unfolds, you will see the brightness of the mid midday sun unfolds much more beautiful. In the body of the Lord, there is life, and those ones are called but to be able towards the King of Glory. The answer. Good. The shame and disgrace to lift up their heads with the fear of God, to lift up their heads and let them know the one they are looking unto him is the light that is going to shine brightly over their lives. In all the circumstances, God's word says this morning, My son, my daughter, I am going to allow my lightning press away to blast some of the dark shadows over your life. Nothing is going to be terrified your life. For I am who I am speaks, and his glory will go flow. And the temple of God will be covered with the light of his countenance. And the people who have been purchased by his blood are the people who have been redeemed by his love. And you have been called for a time just as to know that you have been a chosen vessel of God. No, no weapon that is going to form against you shall prosper, for you have been chosen by God, not by man. Therefore, you must lift up your hands to your glory. Lift up your hearts and be of good courage and be of good surely for no and for sure that God, your God, is standing by your right hand side. To deliver you freely, Father, let the words be words, words that was God in Not only the people, but the congregation. And I pray, God, that your glory shine. And I give you all the glory. I'm going to blow this trumpet, Father. And I ask the people of God to be able to clap their hand a third time, declaring the word of God is going to going to them, grasp them, give over them, engulf them, lift them up, encourage them, know, make them know for sure that you are going to show them who you are. I am who I am. Your greatness did not change for generations together. It will not change in your presence, O oh God. I give you all the glory coming this morning into your mighty hands. In Jesus' mighty name, my prayer. Uh, and those words will come to pass. So, hallelujah. 
Uh, but I would like to say to this morning to Brother Sister Tim, uh, if you would like to stand up uh, for a second, because she is uh, new to our church. I don't know if you understand anything, but what's the exact thing for you this morning? God says that He has put a mantle of influence upon your life. And now he, is, he says that uh, this morning he's speaking, he is speaking to me, that He is going to strengthen your footsteps as you continue to make up your mind to stand for God. Hallelujah. And the word that you speak and the life that you live is going to influence many people around you. And God said you must be bold and courageous to stand for the Lord and to allow His Holy Spirit to work through your life. God says that I have already placed the spirit, a mantle of influence upon your life. You must continue to stand for the Lord. Now we can to bless you, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us give a thank offering to God. And this morning, the brother Rorius, Sylvia, and the family, that the God has been saying that the, the flow of wealth is on your way. I don't know what it is. So I'm just, my heart beat was from the Lord was saying that to you. What are the uh, situations and the uh, things you are going through and uh, appear to be difficult in your life? And God says that you, He's going to allow that the flow is going to streamline towards you. And you're going to give God the glory. Hallelujah. Let us clap your hands and pray for us. The last words are true and trustworthy. God has spoken to a few people here before that He's going to give them some materialistic things about cars, other things. We don't say them because you deserve them. You say them because God says to you. I never hear those things you know, on my own, but I hear from God's testimony. But uh, well, uh, Steve, this morning, I'd like to please uh, stand up and say, um, Steve also is a new, uh, new to our church, my friend. He's been coming to church a few times, and uh, he's one of God. But I would like to say these words of what God has given me. And God says unto you, brother Steve, that he's going to navigate your life. The navigation of your life is getting stronger, and you are put in the right track of God. And God says unto you, I'm going to put you into the place where you should be. You just wait upon and say, yes, Lord, for the plans I have for you are plans to give you hope in the future. My navigation is navigation cannot replicate by anybody else, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us give God the glory. <laughs> sister, a new couple, uh, brother and sister, um, don't know anything about you, brother and sister, because uh, uh, you would like to stand, but both of you. I don't know anything about your background, Sister um, Sish, Sister brought you, Sister last week, and you brought brother this way. I don't know anything about you, this is what I would like to say. God says unto you, the eyes of the Lord have seen the, the eyes of the Lord have seen the eagles. So also God says unto you, I have the eyes of God as a sparrows. So I'm going to build your life, I'm going to build your path for your future. And God says, no, for sure, that not by now. Not by human wisdom and understanding, your life is going to succeed. But God said, if you are trusting me, I am going to raise you up as a people who can be raised by God, cannot be put to shame by any human being. Hallelujah. And you know, you are trusting God, He's going to raise you up to the highest level. And you know for sure that God whom you serve is not a man to tell a lie. Hallelujah. Let's give God the glory. <laughs> sister, uh, let's be sister. Um, this morning, for you as well, if the word. I know, until now we didn't have anything to say, tell you about anything. But uh, when I was worshiping God, as you walked into the church, I felt that God has, uh, God has spoken to me a word, and He said, <coughs> The words of the Spirit of the Living God are to give you an encouragement. And every time you are coming into the presence of God, God says unto you, I'm going to turn the steering of your life in such a dramatic way. And you know, you have seen many people all your life so far. But until now, you have not seen what God can do for you. But you have God's hand and things for you. I want to see my sitting over to man over your life. And you are going to see the what God has kept in store for you. And you have been, you have shared by anybody else. But God said to you, I have seen your misery, I have seen your grief, I am going to, I am going to show the arm of my righteous right hand, and you will know your life will be a living and walking testimony for the living and of your life, says the Lord. Let us give God the glory. Let us thank the Lord. This morning, God gave me a word from the scripture, which I would like to share a few minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes, I am going to share, be patient in the house of God, because the, um, when you go out of the house of God, you don't get much out of the word of God. 
that you come to the house of God, not only you are hearing God's word, but also you are going to receive the breath of heaven breathing into your nostrils. The breath of heaven is actually the of God in your body, not hope. You are going to be blown away with the breath of God. That is the secret of the living self.
It always the case that as the people of God, we have find we have found one blessing from God. He is the when we come to the cross of Calvary, that is our position, that is our place, that is the place of our shame and disgrace, that is the place where we are found to be of no use to anybody. But He took up God to His place of light, transformation, and change. That when people discard you, that He is discarded. When people reject you, He is rejected. When people spit upon you, and you are not taking a spit upon your life. People, uh, you know, an apostle Paul when he was going to went to Damascus, and uh, went to Damascus and, and uh, trying to kill the Christians, he heard the voice of God. Saul, Saul, my son. And the apostle Paul was jealous for God and tried to kill the Christians, saying, Jesus is not the Christ. When he heard the voice of God saying, um, um, Saul, Saul, my son, why do you persecute me? And Saul asked, Who do you, who are you, Lord? He said, Who do you persecute? It is hard for you to kick against the names. I have already been pierced once. I have already been put to death once. It is hard to come back again to follow me and my people and kill them. Give up your weapons. My cross, my production, the cross speaks volumes that I am strong enough. Speaks volumes about you that you are, your strength is going to fail you, my son. My, my, my blood speaks about, about me, says that my blood is going to be making no weakness, but you cannot fail my son, my son, uh, Saul, and his eyes were blind for them. There is a voice coming for every problem, for every, every, every rejection, every depression, every kind of hesitations, allegations. There is only one voice. That is why I want to run. You cannot crucify God more than once. When you did not know him, you were ransomed by him. When you did not love him, his love came searching for you. When you did not come ask for him, you are somebody brought you to the house of God. When, when you are not looking for him, you have been asked to come to the cross of Calvary. But you must remember, his blood is setting you free from the hands of those who are stronger than you. From the hands of those. Who are accusing you of those who are putting you to shame? His blood speaks. That's why it says, Saul, my son, it is hard for you to kick against the nails. I have already been pierced. It is the power of God speaking, creating the pathway where there seems to be nowhere. And it says to the people, when you are lonely, isolated, I have chosen you as my own generation. But I am going to increase you. I am going to make you stronger than your enemies. This is the voice of God, Psalm 105, verse 24. Verse 24, 25 says, And he increased his people greatly, and he made them stronger than their enemies. If God does not make you strong, you are not better in the limelight. If God does not make you strong, what is done? He is his friend. He is not better in the limelight anymore. And Malcolm Turnbull made some statements and he made compromise with the greatest policy said He brought same sex uh, policy in the whole country and he has been given a time frame. He has finished his time and he's gone. But God wants somebody else. But what we stand for, what we believe for, are going to show us that one we are serving is a great God. Every time you come to the house of God, there's a promise speaking to you. You know what is the promise? That's uh, Proverbs 21. Hallelujah. Verse 21 says, He who serves me, Proverbs 21, verse 21, He that follows after righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. I have written down so much of notes from what God spoke to me. But I'm not speaking any of those words. I'm speaking only from the verses. But God's word is giving something else new, different. What I would like to say, if you serve him, if you know that you have been redeemed by the hand of the one who has ransomed you and paid ransom for your life, made you strong, stronger than your enemies, you will remember that you are not weak. You will remember that you are not poor. You will remember that you are not uh, timid. You will remember that your life is not going to be shattered. 
Because he says he's going to increase you. He, he said that he is going to, he is going to increase you, he's going to show you, he's going to make you stronger than your enemies face. The power of redemption has the power to overimpose, overimpose the, the power of God over the strength of the enemy. That's what faith it says, the battle belongs to the Lord, doesn't belong to man. The battle belongs to us, every day we'll be fighting the whole time to come to church. Because so many issues we have in our lives. And over the household will be coming against the household. Husband will be fighting against the wife, wife will be fighting against the husband, children will be fighting against the parents, and everyone will be fighting against God. But there is the God in heaven who sees your conduct, who sees your behavior, who sees your courtesy, who sees your word that you speak, who sees your heart the way that the man does not see, but God sees the heart the way that God sees the heart. And he sees your heart and says, your heart is up to God. You are searching for God. You are searching for him on the cross of Calvary. You do not look at him as he died as, a, as, a, as an infidel or a weak person on the cross of Calvary. But when you are searching for him, looking for the cross, and say, Lord, I am going out now. Lord, I am going out. Please come on a miracle. Lord, I am going to meet somebody else today. Please come on a miracle. I am going to speak to somebody today. Please come on a miracle. Because his God speaks volumes. And he was speaking, he was speaking out of, out of nowhere unto Saul and saying unto Saul, My son, it is hard for you to kick against the nails. My blood has been shown on the cross of Calvary. I have redeemed my people. My strength is greater than your strength. My strength is powerful than your wisdom. My strength is powerful than the way that you are religiously fervent and strong enough. You must give up all these habits and come and follow me. The moment he said, come and follow me. His eyes were blindfolded and open. As the children of God today, we have many things in our hearts. We, we have, for us to have a passion to come to God. The passion is, God sees the heart always. God always says to the son, Samuel said to him, when he told him to go and anoint David, and David was being anointed, and the God said to him, before David was being anointed, he was anointed and anointed his older brothers, who are strong and sturdy warriors, who can be eligible to be a, a kingly leaders. But God says to him, don't look at the appearance of a man or a woman. I'm not there. <coughs> try to be there when I am there. Don't try to be there to say that I am not there. On Sunday morning when you come to the church, you know that God is here. On Sunday morning when you come to church, you know your God is present here. You don't, yes. don't try to be in the place where he is not there. Unless you are crippled, unless you are totally sick and tired, unless you can't really make your journey, you will come searching after him. In other words, Sunday morning is the morning when you have been ordered by God to come under the mantle of God to come and worship him and praise him over your show. Amen. Your desire, your passion, your inclination, your ambition for God. God sees your heart, my son. God sees your innermost heart of your life and says, I have redeemed you. I have set you free from the hands of those who are stronger than you. Sometimes you want people to listen to you. Sometimes you want children to listen to you. Sometimes you want friends to listen to you. Sometimes you the house fly to listen to you. You keep on killing the house and you can kill the house fly. And you come and chase your friends. You get tired of it so many times. Little thing God can use to get you tired. But remember, when the time is meant for you to the house of God to come in the presence of God, you know, I, I always long for Sunday morning to be able to come in the presence of God and sell that I get excited at 12 o'clock. I have been at 12 o'clock, midnight 1 o'clock, to I get so excited to be here on the Sunday morning in the house of God. You know why? I know my God speaks. I know somebody is going to be blessed. I know somebody is going to be delivered. I know somebody will have an answer from God. So when I see the answer from God, you know for sure. Your God, He has ransomed you in the hands of those who are stronger than you. Do you think somebody in this world that you can speak to, that you can boast to, convince somebody? You cannot. With a child, you cannot speak to anyone. Even, even your friend, even your boss, even the closest friend will not listen to you. But they will listen to somebody. They will all listen to Jesus. His presence is going to be all shut in presence. Let me read you a couple of verses. In the book of Job, chapter 42, verse 1 and 5, God was speaking about Job and was talking to his friends. You know what he said? Job was in distress and sorrow, in anguish. Three of his friends tried to comfort him. God called them miserable comforters. 
They have no idea that God was listening to the way that they are comforting his friends. Their friends. And another man of, man of God came in the name of He was a man of learned man, this man of wisdom. He was speaking wise counsels to the Job. But God heard his conversation as well. So the climax came in the, in the, in the chapter 22 of Job. Verse 1. Job was a direct conversation between God and Job. God was speaking to Job before the thing to God. Job said to God, Lord, I know that you can do everything and that no thought of yours can be withheld from you. And God says, Who is he that hired thorns without knowledge? And also Job says, Therefore have I heard that I understood not things too wonderful for which I knew not. So I beseech you that I will, I will speak, I will demand of you and declare them unto me. And verse 5, uh, I have heard of you by the, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes behold you, see you face to face. My eyes see you face to face. Verse 6, I have heard myself and remain in dust and ashes. Job was saying to God, I can see face to face. I have heard about you. They were trying to comfort me. I'm not been comforted. They were trying to give me wise counsel. I'm not comforted. But I'm ready for you for a long time, God. I've been listening about you and now you are. But today you have taken time to come and see me face to face and talk to me. I can talk to you face to face. Great I am who I am. The one who is merciful. The one who says in the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, it says, uh, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the artists of the moon and the stars of the light, stars for a light by night, the one who divides the sea when the waves are of road, the Lord of hosts is his name. The Lord of hosts is his name. Despising shame, despising authority, <coughs> despising the weaknesses, despising the challenges, despising the accusations, despising the allegations, despising the state where you are placed, despising everything, he says. The Lord of hosts says, says, the one who gives the sun for the light by day, and the audiences of the moon, and of the stars for the light by night, which divide the, sea, the one who divides the sea, which the waves thereof roar, and the Lord of hosts is his name. Lord of hosts is his name. By his name, everything that is not listening to him, do you not listen to him, when you know that you have been redeemed by God. <laughs> Therefore, we cannot, people can take it to, uh, can rightly esteem everything, uh, everything about God, but not about the life in the world. When it comes to God, you take it so easy, you take it for granted. You know, take it for so easy, it's so granted. But it's not the case. When Job was crying out to God, and God, and Job was describing about God, you speak, the rest of the sea roar. You speak, the sun gives light by day. You speak, the audiences of the, uh, uh, of the moon and the stars of the sky give light by night. You speak, and, and they will listen to you, God. Now I have the opportunity to see you face to face. What the face to face conclusion? God is speaking to you. Face to face conclusion was about Job. God says unto him, <coughs> God did not say anything to Job. You know what did God say? God spoke to the elephant, the Elipus, and the three friends, Elipus, and also the uh, yeah, and his two friends, his uh, Elipus, uh, and I guess that. Eliphaz and also to Bildad and Zophar, three friends of Job. You know what God said to him? When Job was confessing to God, God was giving his judgment, his verdict, his answer. And you know what he said? I am not happy with you, Eliphaz, Zophar, Bildad, three of you. You have not spoken of the thing which is right like my servant Job has spoken. You have not spoken. In spite of the difficulty and the challenges, and he lost everything in his life, he was uh, uh, struck with a black leprosy, and he was scratching his life, his whole reputation went off from him. In spite of all that, he was, Job was talking about me. I'm the one who speaks, the waves, the road will be, will be roaring. I'm the one who speaks, the sun will give light by day. I'm the one who speaks, the audience of the light by night. Moon and the sun of the sky will give light by night. And he says that I am sinless and spotless. I spoke anything about me. Even though you are an afflicted, even though you are in a good position, even though you have wealth and riches, 
even though you have a fame, even though you have you been of good character, of, of good health, not good health, good, good health, even though everything seems to be all right with you, you did not speak one word about me. You know what he said? My wrath is kindling against you, wrath of God. Wrath of God. If God supposed to see his children to make to understand that you have been redeemed by the hand of God, and to be, to be ransomed by his own blood from the who are stronger than you, you must remember God to speak the word that is good about God. Regardless of what you are going through, God is going to deliver you. Because nothing can separate you from him and from between you and him from his blood, from his from his love. And God spoke to the uh, those friends. My wrath is killing against your love. Elephant was shivering. He was getting tormented completely. You know what he said? But God said to him, give him solution. But I am going to accept only one person's prayer. That Job's prayer would accept his prayer. Go and ask him for prayer. He is going to pray for you and will accept you. Not only prayer, you're going to bring an offering before God. What is offering? Seven bullocks, seven ox, seven rams. You know, that's big. Bring an offering before God means all the seven spirits of God, seven attributes of God are going to be pacified. God's anger is uh, burning over against your life through his wisdom, through his wealth, through his riches, through his glory, through his blessing, through his honor, through his uh, compassion, mercy. All that he wants to show you in your life because it's not even speak anything good about God. God said, my love is killing all your life. So take seven bullets, seven rams, and bring your offering before God. My son is done with prayer. Remember, your life has been a ransom. Ransom means somebody has to pay a huge price for somebody who has been held captive and slave, cannot be redeemed by anybody because the, the redemptive power, power of the human is not available by riches, by wealth, by love, by mercy, by kindness. But God says, I am going to be a ransom for your life. He paid, he, he paid uh, his uh, life as a ransom for me. I like to read Matthew 20, 28. Son of man, son of man, talking about son of man, Matthew 20, 28. I'll quote it a couple of verses. Matthew 20, 28. Son of man came to serve. Son of man came to serve. Matthew 20, 28. Sorry. Even son of man came, to, came not to be ministered, but to minister. Not to be served, but to serve. To give his life a ransom for many. He just came to give his life. Without him, there is no remission of sins. Without him, there is no redemption. Without him, you cannot be greater than your enemies. Without him, your, your, your allegations cannot be able to go through your life. Without him, your challenges will not leave you. Without him, all that is changing your life cannot leave you. Without him, nothing is going to hold you back. Without him, nothing is going to bless you. Without him, nothing is going to increase your life. Without him, if you're not going to be your lifetime high priority in your life, nothing is going to hold you back. He says, Son of man came to be, came to be, came to be serving, not to be served. He gave his life a ransom for many. That's why God plans many blessings for his children, but one thing God sees your heart. Where is your heart? You're only coming to the house of God for a blessing, only coming to the house of God for some kind of achievement. Of course, God blesses people, but God sees your heart. Because our lifetime in the hand of God is drafted in the hand of God for a lifetime of blessing, not for a short spell of blessing. Your blessing from God is going to be released into your life. You will know your enemies will back up from your life. And those who hate you will move away from your life. Those who reject you cannot reject you anymore because they are becoming weaker and weaker day after day. You know, I know a couple of politicians, I won't mention names, but uh, when they were speaking against the church, against people, and uh, within, uh, within a week, the memory of their names have been taken from the books of politics of Australia. They have been taken away. Just the memory of them. That means the names have been eradicated. Then the memory of them has been obliterated, and then they, they, they never have now been mentioned again as a significant politician in Australia, as a people of God. Today you have a lifeline. The lifeline is when you are, you are weak even today. When you are having less of him, you are weak. When you have more of him, 
you are stronger. When you have more of him, you look like a lion. When you have more of him, you look like a you look like a giant in the Torah. When you have more of him, you are a, you are a highly skillful, wanted man. I would like to give you, give you an example quickly. You know, in the year 2006, when this was, uh, when she was getting born, you know, we had the transition to look for a house and um, and also to be able to fix us. When she was uh, uh, when she was six months old, uh, being uh, six months, three months old, uh, six months old, uh, and when I was carrying her, and uh, I lost my job, and uh, it was looking very negative. But one thing I realized that I went to a Quran um, bookstore, bookstore, and uh, there I bought a CD. Then I got ten dollars. Then not much money. Bought a CD. Bought the CD. Came home and put it in the car seat. And uh, I listened to the first song. I listened to the second song. I listened to the third song. I listened to the fourth song. And he was speaking to me. God, I want to speak to some song. I want to hear something. Some song to be speaking to me. There was eight song coming up to it. All things are going to be working for you all right. Everything is going to be all right for you. Everything is going to be all right for you. And uh, because you are in God, everything is going to be all right. The song was coming again and again. I said, this is the song I'm looking for from God. And I would not even imagine a $10 worth of CD would have opened to contain a song that God speaks to me. But I trust in God, I want $10 in the CD. And uh, after that, things began to work in fear of me. From here, uh, and she was, uh, when she was, uh, when she was getting, uh, getting, getting to be born. And we moved to the house when I had no job. And bank manager called me and told me, you have no job, and to, 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 therefore the house broke to sell. What are you going to do? I said, forget about everything. Just let us move forward. Don't look backward. He said, what are you talking? I said, you can't do anything now. Tomorrow is a one day, one day, one day, day. The day after, I'm going to move to the property. I said, what do you want to do? I said, I said you don't worry about what's happening at the moment. Ignore everything. Let's move forward. I said, oh, okay, I'll do what you said. So he said to me, and got everything for me. What I'm saying is, when we know many of the time we are appear to be weak, Many of the times they appear to be, appear to be uh, unstable. Many of the times they appear to be uh, having no direction in our lives. But one thing you know for sure, God who has purchased you through his blood, ransomed you from the hands of those who are stronger in wisdom, who are stronger in stature, who are stronger in understanding, who are stronger in wealth, who are stronger than you in beauty, who are stronger than you in intellect, who are stronger than you in all that you put them together. He has redeemed us by his blood. Hallelujah. He has redeemed us. We have confidence in God. We that when we come to church and saw him every, every Sunday, not every Sunday, every day, is a day for us to serve the Lord. For some of us, for some of you, maybe on Sunday to come to serve the Lord. But one thing you must remember: the God who has His hands upon your life and says, "I will increase you." When you know when your enemies are going to be defeated before you, Hallelujah. you are going to see increase over your life. Greatest principle of God's multiplication is increasing is coming to coming upon your life, and you know that your enemies are going to be big before you. Hallelujah. Let us give God the glory. And let us give God the glory. Let us give God the glory.
not without Him, not bypassing Him, not knowing Him, but everything that you have through Him is counted because He's going to bring increase upon your life, increase of God bring upon your life. And your enemies will back off, those who hate you will back off, those who reject you will back off, those who divide you will back off, those who don't like you will back off. Because your heart should be, your heart, my heart should be pursuing Christ in all of intensity, imagination, and ability, and character, and strength. You need to pursue God. If you don't pursue God, one school boy, little boy comes and says, Get out from here! And you don't know what to say. When they know that you belong to God, and they say, I'm glad that you are here. It's a big difference. Somebody says unto you, I'm glad that you are here. Big appreciation. And somebody comes and say, Man, get out. You don't know who you are from here. It's a big difference. There are the children of God, no more. God, each day, not one day, each day, is going to be a great day in your life. Amen. When you know that your God is stronger, and you know you are stronger, and you know when your God is stronger, and you know that your God has redeemed you from the hands of God, who are stronger than you? From the hands of those who are greater than you. From the hands of those who are putting you to shame. Because your exploits, your wealth of riches are going to be in Christ. And you will now be defeated because he had been tried on the words of the cross of Calvary. He said to Saul, my son, son, my son, how long you persecuted me? How many times you persecuted me? Who are you, Lord? He said, I am the one whom you persecute, Jesus of Nazareth. You know, every day in the life of your life, you will remember what you do unto him has been accounted for in the book of remembrance of God. And day is going to come. And in all that it come, this is the month of September. It has come. This is the month, and you know the strength of your God is going to manifest. How many of you believe that? This is the month of September. Your God's provision, your God's blessing, your God's exploits, your God's promises, your God's deliverance, your God's honor, your God's the words of acceptance. God says, My wrath is kindling against your enemies. But you, 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 each one of you will find your exploits in me. For I'm stronger than your enemies. My son, my daughter, God says. Give me one minute, I'll close before I close one. One last words. Jeremiah 31, verse 35, 36, 37. Can somebody read it, please? Jeremiah 31, 35. I'll come to this, this last verse. Sorry, uh, I think I'll take it from the yeah, other six months. Those items depart Just two things I want to point out here. Conclusion, final conclusion. Just want to tell one last verse. Before God began to say one blessing for this promise, Jehovah 31, verse 11 started. But verse uh, uh, 12, 13, God promised the bountifulness of God, the blessing of God, wealth, wealth, riches, and claim, and every multiplication is going to come. Uh, verse 12, that is called the bounty of God. That is for those who have been granted by God. But God said in the chapter 1 verse 35, where the island before, the sun by light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars is light by night, which he divided the sea and the waves of the Lord of hosts is there. 
And he said, Pharisees, if those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, if those ordinances depart from before me, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. The blessing of God's word is, is conforming. My redemptive power is the grace of God upon the people of God is, he's saying that, I have established the sun, moon, and the stars of the sky, and the sea and the rest of the seas of the rest of the sea running the rock. I have established these are called the ordinances. Ordinances. If those ordinances are going to depart from before me, you can understand the word. If they are going to depart from before me, I will also seize my people from being my nation. The text of power is, I am making you stronger than your enemies. I have ransomed you. It is concluding with the grace of God. Sun and the moon and the stars of the sky will witness what God is going to do in your life. Hallelujah. You have been enlightened. Sun and the moon and the stars of the sky are going to witness my redemption upon your life. My plan upon your life. My plan to execute your life. My plan of increase upon your life. Who are going to witness them? Sun and the moon and the stars of the sky. When you go into the waters of the sea, when the sea swells, roar in the rock, and there will witness the increase of God upon your life. What God will you serve? If that is not going to happen, God says, if they are going to not see what I'm going to show you, you will not be my people anymore. In other words, that is going to happen, you are going to be my people forever. The stability what God can promise for his people is sun and the moon and the stars of the sky and the sea and the waves of the sea, the roaring waves, will witness today what God has spoken in your life that what God's plans are going to come to pass. Hallelujah! 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 Yes. If you want to say hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! hallelujah. God is going to witness can I get a witness? One witness? Can I get a witness? Two witnesses? Can I get a witness? Three witnesses? Your God is going to make you to see the witness of heaven and the earth. That is the God whom we serve. That is the God whom we worship. That is the God who was crucified for you on the cross of Calvary. That is the God who is going to be your answer. Your desire will come to pass because of you. Hallelujah. One last verse. Thus says the Lord, if heaven and above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth search out with it, if there's any human, any scientist, any rock, any, any um, um, scientist, any uh, scientist above and below, if any wise man, any navigator, anybody else in this world, if there's anybody, if the heaven, they are able to measure the heaven above and the foundations of the earth below, the search it. He said, God says, I will cast off my people. The height of the heavens, the depth of the foundations of the earth is not the human capacity to measure and to search. God says, I am searching for those who are searching for me. So that you know for sure the plans I have for you. Are the plans to redeem you in the hands of those who are oppressing you, in the hands of those who are persecuting you, in the hands of those you have been oppressed and you are not able to move forward and you put your head down with shame and distress and you know when you are redeemed, you are going to increase before you are redeemed. That is not going to be for a short span of time. Hallelujah. Heavens above can be measured, foundations of the earth can be searched. I will also, I will also cast off. All the sea of Israel, for all that they have done to me, says God. That means, God, your God, my God, will never cast off your life in my life. Your, so, your, the depth of your life and the height of your life has all been measured. Search! So, we are fortunate. We are tremendously fortunate yes. because of Jesus. Yes. And to know He has a voice. Speaking when you are sleeping. He has a voice speaking yes. on your behalf when people are talking against you and you don't know what yes. 
He has a wise speech about your life saying that this man needs increase, not decrease, because he has searched me, he has found me, he has known me, he knows that I am, I am who I am, all in all for you. Whoa! That is the God we serve. That is the God we worship. What you know about him, how much you know about him, it matters because more of him, less of you, more of his blessings, more of him, less of you. You will be in the, in the church on Sunday morning. You will tell your friends, your families, your people that you know all that you are searching for a boundary. Yeah, Christ Jesus of Nazareth, the one who built the foundation of the earth and the, and the height of the heavens. And the heavens and the earth, sun, moon, stars in the sky, and the sea, and the sea waves, they are well witness what your God is going to do for you. And this month of September is going to be the month that God is going to show you. And heaven to do this. Let's give you a big time for the see.